Hi, I'm Shelly Palmer of MedAcademy, the platform where you can learn about all things NFT risk-free. I'm here at the Edge of NFT podcast, where you can educate yourself on what's cutting edge today and beyond. So keep listening. Hi, NFT Curious listeners. Stay tuned for today's episode and learn how today's guest is helping to educate the masses about the meaning and capabilities of Web3, the metaverse, AI, and much more. And why today's guest thinks Amazon is like an alien with acid for blood that can take on any new challenge and come out ahead. And why the only grudge you want to keep is against grudges themselves. All this and more on today's episode. Finally, NFTLA 2022 was a blast. It was also a blast off. In a giant plume of bright burning rocket fuel, Web3, NFTs, blockchain, decentralization, and a suite of immersive new tech developments have just exploded onto the canvas of life. Outer Edge is the theme of this year's event, dedicated to those of you building with us at the outer edges, making the future happen. The community-centric gathering returns to Los Angeles, March 20th to the 23rd, 2023, to uplift creators and technologists through interactive experiences, a wide variety of discussions and presentations, and entertaining surprises that transport participants to the outer edge of what's possible when we co-create a new paradigm embracing the decentralized web, artificial intelligence, extended reality, and more. To register to attend or learn how to co-create an experience on the Outer Edge, head over to outeredge.live. The event is being organized by the Edge of Company and us, founders of the Edge of NFT podcast. See you there. Welcome to the Edge of NFT podcast with your hosts, Jeff Kelly, Ethan Janney, and Josh Krieger. We aim to bring you not only the top 1% of what's going on with NFTs today, but what will stand the test of time. We explore the nuts and bolts and the business side, but also the human element of how NFTs are changing the way we interact with the things that we love. This podcast is for the futurists and dreamers, the disruptors and creators, the fans and connectors, and the makers and doers that are pumped about this ecosystem and driving where it goes next. Today's episode features Shelly Palmer, the co-founder of MetaCademy, the world's first platform where you can earn while you learn about cryptocurrency and NFTs. Shelly is the professor of advanced media and residence at Syracuse University, SI Newhouse School of Public Communications, CEO of the Palmer Group, a consulting practice that helps Fortune 500 companies with technology, media, and marketing, and co-founder of Meta Academy, a free educational platform that teaches practical applications of blockchain, crypto NFTs, Web3, and the metaverse. Hey, Shelly, welcome to Edge of NFT. Thank you. What a nice intro. I'm going to definitely record that for my wife. All good. Yeah, man, just play that, <laughs> you know, put it on the, put it on the, uh, put that in the loop. Auto. <laughs> Shelly actually is a great guy. Give him a break, wife. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, that's some great, that, that's some great subject matter, man. All, all stuff near and dear to our heart for sure. Um, but, but also, you know, Shelly author, uh, a couple big, big books, right? Blockchain, cryptocurrency, NFTs, and smart contracts, an executive guide to the world of decentralized finance and also television disrupted. And even though different subjects, uh, a lot of, uh, of, of commonality and some of the underlying, you know, themes there. And especially as it applies to, I think the world that we're in right now, the current market, which is evolving so quickly and, you know, curious, we'd love to start there really and, and get a sense for, you know, insights from those texts to today's world, today's market, like everything's moving so rapidly, man. I think, first of all, thanks for mentioning the books. Really, realistically, everybody is a content company. Everybody is a media company and it all communication now fits in to a, a one big bucket. And it literally doesn't matter if it's just you and your smartphone or you and a film crew, you have one job and one job only. And oddly enough, it's the same job. 45,000 years ago in a cave in Spain, someone took some red goo and put their handprint on a wall. And the job of that media was to be seen. Whoever did that wanted someone else to see it. First, they wanted to enjoy it for themselves or they wouldn't have done it. And then they wanted other people to see it. Now, the technology they had at the time was red goo on their hand, and you had to go into the cave to see it. Today, anybody with a smartphone can do anything they want, 
and it's available to every one of 4 billion people on earth almost instantaneously and the other two and a half to three billion that could potentially see it who are conscious enough and old enough and you know could get to it at a certain point so you go from i must go in the cave to see the technology displayed to i can reach literally every person on earth that's connected the, the change isn't what it's how and everybody who forgets that first and foremost you need to have something to say you have to want people to understand what you're feeling and realize that in a way that they can feel and understand what you are feeling or understand so the idea of right person right place right message right time has never ever changed and all of my books are about that first and foremost and then the methodologies that you will use the workflow and process you'll use in the modern era or in what's just coming over the horizon that will change the way you think you should do it and help you do it in a more efficient more effective way and that, that's really what the books are about that's a teaser to you know we got to talk about chat gpt if shelly's on the show at some point i think that's a good teaser right there guys. <laughs> we'll get there we'll get there <laughs> A favorite subject as you can imagine yeah, yeah of course yeah it's on our roadmap for the day for sure well-crafted answer of course shelly as well as a as the university professor that you are uh <laughs> <laughs> delivered concisely it's a, side hustle. it's a side hustle for sure yeah, no, i love <laughs> that my favorite side hustle my, i teach in the master's program at the new house school so and i teach a, a, a course called advanced media business and there's a there's actually a master's degree called advanced media business there so they hired they hired me to help teach it I like I like Nassim Nicholas Taleb's approach to uh, professorship. I think he's like a quarter time professor or like a half time or something like that. And he says like that's all he wants because he does like he wants the kind of like you know the nice academic environment and all that, but not all the like you know logistical responsibilities and <laughs> politics of the whole oh, system. Yeah, politics at a university? I can't imagine. <laughs> no, it's, it's certainly there. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, clearly, no, whether it's inside of of the, you know, traditional academy or our outside education is really important to you. Uh, I'm sure that's a big part of, you know, what's behind founding Met Academy. And, uh, you know, people can learn about how blockchain works, how to send crypto, mint NFTs, lots more stuff. Um, how did this come into being? And uh, why do you feel it's such a powerful tool here so, in, for the future? It's such an interesting story for, to me anyway. So. 2018, I've collected a bunch of essays. I write a newsletter uh, every day, and uh, it's a very large mailing list. I'm very lucky. We've been doing it since 1996, literally every single day. And on uh, during the week, it's kind of a rant and synopsis of the news stories that have my attention. And on Saturdays, it's either a full day of AI. It's either AI Saturday or Web3 Saturday, depending. It's a synopsis of those interesting stories. I kind of take Saturdays off, to tell you the truth. And I just grab all the things that were good for the week. And on Sundays, I write a thought leadership piece. That's what I really do on Saturday. I spend a couple, three hours writing 1,500 words or something like that about something that I care about. So by 2018, I'd written a bunch of... Um, fairly good essays about blockchain, cryptocurrency, smart contracts, the, the pretty much the whole world of DeFi. And I wasn't really thinking much about it, but I had these essays. They're all, they're all on ShellyPalmer.com online. And then I had collected them and we sort of were going to make an ebook. And then we got busy doing something else. As you know, end of 2019, early 2020, the year of crypto, everybody was like crypto crazy and NFTs exploded. So we went back and said, you know, we should probably collect the writings and throw an ebook online so that people know that we know what this is. Our clients all, we've been doing supply chain and fraud prevention and all the things you do with tokenized content for our media company uh, clients. But NFTs were a different animal, same tech, but a different animal. And they had a lot of consumer hype around it. So I thought I would put together the book. So uh, thank you for mentioning, you know, blockchain, cryptocurrency, NFTs, an executive guide to decentralized finance. So I was going to give it away for free. Like that was my plan. I'm giving this book away for free. And then, and so I, I collected it. I made a little cover. Like I did the whole thing you're supposed to do. And I thought PDF, I'll make an ebook. Like I'll Amazon KDP, like I'll put it in Kindle publishing. So I'm up there and I'm uploading the thing and I do the cover and I do everything you're supposed to do. And it starts asking for SEO. And I'm like, well, I, I teach SEO. I do it for a living. I teach my client. Like, oh, I don't. I'm a pretty good, let me do my, let me do my real. So I spend like an hour and I 
all my tools and I'm like, everything I know how to do to SEO this to death, change the title slightly, change the description, like you, everything, put it up there. Amazon says, what's the price? I'm thinking free and they're not. They're, that's Amazon is not thinking free. So it's like, hmm, $2.99, $7.99. I don't know. I'll put a number. So I put a number and I go to sleep and I don't think about it anymore. And I wake up the next morning and we'd sold 35,000 copies and the book was number one in three categories. I'm like, what? Wow. What? So of course, this was 100% about the title and the essay. Like all the, if honest to God, guys, if I was trying to do this, I would have failed miserably. All I wanted to do was put a value on this. But I figured, well, if it's got a price, then I can say, you're getting a $7.99 book for free or a $2.99 ebook for free. Like I, you know, it's just good marketing to give it away something that has a value. Anyway, the first moment I put it up, I needed to do the second edition because like things had changed that week. And I, I, I needed to update it. Well, updating an ebook is no problem at all, but updating like a little paperback that requires new pagination. And then they have to approve like on, on Amazon, that is a, a week long process of pain. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll do the second edition. Now the, it's still called second edition, but we're like in the 19th edition, but it's still called second edition because we're having an argument with our Amazon about the cover. Why am I telling you this story? It occurred to me that all this content ought to live on a, in some kind of learning management system so I could keep it updated every single day. And that when something changed overnight, it would take me 30 seconds to go into the CMS and change it. And then people could just, and then we could use it as a teaching tool for all of our executive clients. We do workshops and seminars for, for our, uh, our Fortune 500 clients. We can work right off the screen. They don't have to have the book and the book doesn't have to be out of date. And I can give them a blank notebook to take notes if they don't want to take notes in their PC. And it just, and that's how Med Academy was born. And it, it just, it's just an easier way to keep stuff really up to date. And, and so that, that's the whole purpose. And now we're, we've got a bunch of courses. The, the NFT and crypto is up as are a bunch of others. We're just about to put up um, web three and the metaverse. And then we've got another uh, course of study. That's a little more eclectic called prompt crafting, which is about, properly crafting prompts for generative AI, whether it's um, art AI or uh, pre-trained transformers like G uh, chat GPT, where you're learning to coach it and give you the best possible, most efficient outputs. So yeah, that's what Med Academy is for, just so that we can teach the most current information mm -hmm. all of the time. Yeah, that makes, that makes so much sense too. And I think, you know, this is a lot of people every time the concept of like the metaverse and what it's going to look like, right. Comes up. I'm always like, it's going to look like what works for people. And it's usually, it's going to not look like what we already do. Right. Like it, the answer to the metaverse is not a lecture hall in the metaverse. You can have a lecture hall in real life metaverse. It's better to have people up close and not pretend like you're in this huge room with an echo in it or something. So, right. So we have a very, very different uh, set of thoughts about the word metaverse, which is undefined in every way. And by the way, Web3 also undefined. So um, you ask anybody, they're going to tell you what they think the metaverse means. And that's not good for anybody, to be fair. The way we look at it, and we define this every time we talk about it, is uh, what I call the observable metaverse. And the observable metaverse goes from augmented reality on one side. And augmented reality starts with the heads-up display in your car or just maybe holding your phone up and seeing something superimposed over the image that, that your phone camera is showing you. So some data is being surfaced that augments your experience. That's one side. And then we move closer to extended or, or um, mixed reality where there may be haptic feedback. You may be in a retail environment. Maybe the end cap is changing. It doesn't need to be with goggles or glasses. Maybe it's a projector. Maybe it's a screen. The key part of this is that there's a bunch of different data sets. There's the batch data at the CRM system at the client that has a single view of the customer. There's the network topology of the wide area network, and it understands where you are and what you're doing. There's the local area network that is very much attached to you and your device. And then there's whatever you're using for edge compute, whether that's goggles or your handset. All of these data sets have to be brought together in near real time to surface the data that's going to build the experience that we're talking about. So in our world, the observable metaverse starts at AR, then it goes to mixed reality and extended reality, uh, which have very similar definitions, and then ends up in virtual reality or virtual worlds. Most people, when they say metaverse, they mean virtual worlds. If I, if I want to go there, after the observable metaverse, 
And we actually have what we call the standard model of the metaverse, which is all the technologies in columns that you need to create everything we just described from augmented through virtual reality. But the all of this is usually conflated, rightly or wrongly, because again, there's no accepted or agreed upon definition. All of this is usually conflated with some weirded out definition of Web3. Again, there's no agreed upon def. But for us, the way we think about Web3 is a decentralized platform that will allow both users and creators to share in the value they create. Now, that's a pretty broad way to describe it, but the key there is decentralization. So if you're saying to me that metaverse means Roblox, first of all, it's Web 2, it's fully centralized, and it's in a browser. There's nothing Web 3 or metaverse about it. So if that's your definition, then state your definition is a online you know, game, the graphics game that's world building, and you're building virtual worlds. Virtual worlds don't need to be decentralized to be played. They don't like that. So not to put too fine a point on it. We try to be very precise when we define these things because we're building for clients with real money for real outcomes. So you say, okay, I need a decentralized environment to do what? Most brands are central authorities. So where does the decentralization come in? Well, secondary market for NFTs. Sure. You would like that to be capable of being traded in a trustless environment. I'd like that. If you're going to put together a DAO or you're going to put together some kind of ownership model, yeah, you might need to be able to trade in a decentralized way if there's decentralized governance. There are a bunch of reasons, good reasons to, to, to think about the decentralization of your business model. But most of our clients are central authorities. They're big brands. And this, what makes them a central authority is that you trust them. So what, it's not a trustless environment. It's exactly the opposite. If you're a big sports league, if you're top shot, the NBA is the central authority in the United States about basketball. The NHL is hockey. The NFL is football. There's no bigger central authority in football than the NFL. So what is decentralized now exactly that you want to do? Come and bring me bring me your use case. Bring me the business outcome you're trying to achieve. So that's why I, I really feel like while everyone's using these terms all over the place and pretending they know what they're talking about, every time I say to somebody, okay, what do you mean? Like, what are you trying to achieve? I I get a lot of word salad back, right? It's not it's not all because these are definitions that you need to state when you start the combo. So for us, the metaverse as we look at it is really a data play, and it is the turning those those data sets into action and surfacing these experiences. That's the future. How you do it is way more complicated than how I just said it. And then from a meta from a Web three perspective. The key there, Web 3 versus Web 2, is decentralization. And if you don't have a decentralization schema that you need, then you might as well do it with a well-structured database and a secure password in Web 2. It'll be faster, cheaper, and more bulletproof And uh, by, by definition. So I kind of sit in a different place than most of our friends that, that are deeply, deeply into the word salad and less into the business outcomes, to be fair. Right. That's very useful too. And I think, you know, part of the reason I just brought up the concept in general was just around the function. The functionality is really what's most important in all of these things. And people sometimes miss it. And I think my point too, is like, when you talked about how you're releasing this book and you turned it into an online courseware, right? Like I've seen this recently, like, you know, look at Malcolm Gladwell, he puts out an audio book. Yeah. It's got actual recorded quotes from the people instead of him reading the quotes. Why not do that? Right? It? it was wonderful. Right. Why not add music, all these things. Right. And so um, that's kind of what you're doing. Think out, think outside of the box and create what you can. Uh, that's most functional for what the users want out of it. I think it's, it's, it's really beautiful and elegant. Yeah, I agree. And um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, of meta Academy personally. I've recommended it to a number of folks, oftentimes I've been asked the question, um, you know, speaking and various things like where do people go to learn? Because um, there's a lot to unpack here. And I think Meta Academy is a really great, pure learning environment that you've created. I appreciate what you're doing there. And, you know, there's a there's another set of definitions I think we should unpack while we're on it, while we have the professor on our show. Why not? Um, <laughs> And, and, and that's really about synthetic media, which is a topic that you've spoken about quite a lot. And I'd love to sort of delve into what's different or similar um, about it than generative synthetic media. Sure. That's a, it's a great question, Josh. And, and um, 
We are very familiar with synthetic media and everyone's an expert in it, to be fair, whether you know you're an expert in it or not, everybody is because from the very first time you saw anybody in a science fiction movie or TV show and you went, that looks fake. Like as soon as you said that looks fake, what you were doing is you were criticizing the people who created the synthetic media. It, in 1977, in uh, episode four, a, a, a New Hope and and the the opening scene, the Star Destroyer is coming over your head and you are out of your mind when you see it in the theater for the first time. You don't even know what to do. I was sitting in the third row because we got there late and there was you were I, we might have been sitting in the second row. This thing was like, oh my God, I'd never seen anything like it. It was motion control. Lucas, you know, Lucasfilm did motion control. And that media can't exist outside of that experience. You needed to be watching it on a screen. There are no Star Destroyers and they don't fly over your head normally. So we're all experts in synthetic media, all of us. And the way you, use, you create something synthetically now is very well understood. You will use every tool you can get your hands on. You'll use digital audio workstations and digital video workstations. You will use AI-assisted or, or, or generative adversarial network tools to, to build whatever it is you're building. You'll animate. You'll, you will use computers and you will use um, everything you can to, to build these experiences if, for people to see the original movie avatar the very first one all right that's a totally synthetic world it's gorgeous i unbelievable how much time and energy they spent making this thing so we know what it looks like we know what it looks like when it's great but it also requires lots of people do you see the credit list of the original avatar it like goes on for like 30 minutes like it's almost as long as the movie you've got this like credit list of model makers and puppeteers and animator like on and on and on we're all experts we're in a, we're in a new place now and within just, I'm going to say more than a year and less than three years, we're going to see the generative tools, uh, the ones that are based on the uh, pre-trained transformer models, the large language models that, uh, that Google and uh, OpenAI have. We're going to see people start to do generative synthetic media. And this is going to change pretty much everything. Now, if you open up chat GPT and you start to coach it, and you tell it what you want. The first thing you say to ChatGPT is, you are an expert blogger, an expert tech blogger. Your audience is uh, an audience of senior executives at Fortune 500 companies who are interested in tech, but do not know all the tech nomenclature they should. In simple terms, but with respect to their senior positions, please write a blog post about the following, and then you describe the blog post. Or please write an outline for the blog post about a blog post about the following. You're going to get something pretty good back. You coach this for another couple of minutes, giving it a little attaboy when it gets it right and bad computer, stick your nose in it when you get it wrong. You're going to get some good output. Now, you need the subject matter expertise at the moment to do your own fact checking, because when a large language model is right, it's very right. And when it's wrong, it's very wrong. And it speaks authoritatively to you in human speech, in human, you know, human ways. And you're going to sit there and it's so authoritative. You go, that must be true. I got, you got to go Google that stuff if you don't know what it is, because you can really write a blog post that's complete nonsense out yes. of chat GPT. I'm mean, complete nonsense. Um, so the way we think about this, I'm just setting this up. Don't ask chat GPT, by the way, to write history. Uh, because it will it will rewrite history. <laughs> it, it can. So the way we look at ChatGPT and all generative pre-trained transformer, uh, all the transformer models, you've got accuracy on one side and fluency on the other. That's the one axis. And then you've got high stakes, low stakes. And so you you need to, if I'm writing, call it a poem for my daughter's birthday, Accuracy isn't really important, but fluency is. It needs to be flowery and it needs to have good language. It's very low stakes. If it doesn't get it right or wrong, it does like, I'll fix it, right? If you're writing a recommendation letter, it's pretty low stakes. You're going to edit it right there. You'd like it to be very fluent. If you're asking it to make a decision that you're going to base something on, like, should you buy something or make a business investment, you need the accuracy to be very high and the stakes are getting high. You need to find a sweet spot at the moment inside these large language models and the applications that sit on top of them. You need to find a sweet spot where you are comfortable at the output. These models learn. So think about the three layers. You've got the, the infrastructure layer at the bottom where the GPUs and the TPUs are sitting and all of the inference workload will be done 
by whatever AI model is going to be put on top of it. Sitting above that are the foundational models or the models themselves. And then sitting above that are the applications. So you need all these things in, in order and in line in order for this to work for you. But once the models start to get good, and once people start to build applications that are uniquely crafted for making video, for replacing faces, for synthesizing voices, for replicating styles of music, for you go down the list of things you would need in the media business to help you craft a message or create a piece of content. We are this close to you being able to describe in words what you want and having it surfaced. I would need I need a 15 second video about blank. I want it to feature Morgan Freeman or someone who looks like him and I you uh, describing it in words and then you are once you get there which I think is more than a year and less than 3 years away once you get there you are seconds away from generating using another AI tool the description in data that's more efficient so that rather than send one message to the whole audience you can literally target individuals with the media they're going to be most likely interested in we are so close to generative synthetic media in the history of media you know we're we're under i think 60 months away from seeing workable solid it's going to start with just text as we're seeing with chat gpt then it's going to go to audio cuz it's easy way music is incredibly algorithmic after you get music going you're going to start getting some primitive video some graphics and then ultimately the whole thing's going to come together and and you can just see the sequence there's so much of it out there right now so yeah the synthetic uh the synthetic media story we know deeply now we're just going to it's just automation at this point and and yeah and by the way like this doesn't just apply to to words i, I moderated a panel um recently in Miami with a company that's doing this with uh, building infrastructure within virtual worlds using uh, generative AI, right? Where 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 you could literally build the infrastructure based on the taste of the individuals that you're building it for. It, it, it's so mind blowing to think about this. And, and I'm a little bit apprehensive to go down that rabbit hole because I don't know if I'll ever get back up. And you know, well, these are true. Honestly, Josh, these are the, the things that are going to, to work well are things that are ordered and highly algorithmic. They're going to work the best and the most accurately. Music, you know, if you want to do something in a reggae genre, or you want to do something in, in a jazz genre, or you want to do something in a swing genre, or you want to do something in hip hop, there are rules that make these pieces like I take the same chord progression and make it sound like club date musicians are playing it at a wedding or bar mitzvah, and or make it sound like a metal band. Same chords, it just it's the way you play and what you play and the orchestration and the, you know, the instrumentation, meter and rhythm, and the way you're just gonna, you know the way that this thing feels and the and the uh, timbral elements and the sonic landscape you choose this is very very rule based it's easy to do by computer because it's you learn the rules if i'm writing four part barbershop i'm i had to learn the rules of four part harmony in order to write this and the rules are well understood by everybody who's ever been to music school so it's not and a lot of people haven't it's just well understood when you start talking about writing code when you start talking about being able to build infrastructure the way you you were Remember, what makes a transformer interesting is that it's parallel. Uh, you you can it parallelizes. I I don't even know if that's a word very well. Where the older AI models, neural networks, you could not parallel compute and gain much capability. These you can parallel process and gain a, a lot of function. And the other thing that's important is they the way that the transformers work. What made this thing crazy is that the order of words, the order of instructions, matter. So Jill is looking for trouble is a different sentence than trouble is looking for Jill. The same, they're the same words in the sentence, but they are completely different meanings. And the order of the words is what gives the meaning. So the transformer models take these things in order. And that's like, that's the methodology that, that this particular generative AI, uh, the pre-trained transformers use. So what's cool about this is it applies to all human endeavors that are language-esque. It applies to chemistry. Chemistry is a language. So microbiology, like the, I, I, I was talking to some guys at IBM today and they're working on a generative pre-trained transformer, large model 
not for language. They're going to build it for the language of chemistry. Like they're getting into materials processing for one of their clients. And I was talking to the, the, the senior, uh, the chief data scientist on this thing. And he was like, let me explain to you the language of chemistry. And he, he just starts going. And I'm not a chemist. So he's speaking Martian to me. But I got what he was. I mean, you could see where he was going with this. It's like this has all it's a rule base that we understand it. And because we can understand it, we can describe it. And if we can describe it to each other, we can describe it to a computer and to, to, to an AI model. And they're building the foundational models for chemistry. Mind blowing. Like that, that caught me off guard today because I don't think about other things that humans communicate in that mm. aren't, you know, music and words and pictures. Like that's my world. Right. Yeah. This guy's world is chemistry. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Two things I want to share. One right off, right off the back of what you're saying. Um, I heard somebody was, I believe, mixing chat GPT with um, Wolfram Alpha, Alpha, Alpha which is, yeah. you know, the mathematical languages. And okay. they did an incredible job of, of sort of interpreting. You could just tell it to solve an equation in language and it'll do it, stuff like that. So fascinating stuff. Um, here's what I want to share, though, before we go to the next question. Uh, I did have Chad GPT write a poem for your daughter's birthday, flowery with good language. So I just wanted to share that uh, really quick. A blossom of grace, wisdom's bright ray. You've grown into a beauty, come what may. On this special day, your birthday, my dear, may joy follow you always year after year. So you can take that and pass it along. <laughs> I, I, I will. I, I don't know how long it would have taken you to write that on your own <laughs> i promise you chat gpt took under 15 seconds to do it well and by the way the first version it had was several more stanzas and and more you know even I, I said flowery with good language so it, it it took it to the hilt there for sure yeah and, and flowers <laughs> and yeah but at the end of the day look we're i think honestly guys there is a time before artificial light and after the world changed. Once you had a commercial artificial light bulb and you could light up and you could stay up for 20 hours a day, the world was different. There was a time before the steam engine and after the steam engine. Before the steam engine, we could build what we could build. After the steam engine, we built the world around us. It amplified the value and the power of our muscles by thousands, if not millions of times. AI is going to do for, or there's going to be before pre-trained transformers and after retrain transformers and this is going to amplify the power of our minds by thousands or millions of times i i'm gaining about 15 to 25 minutes a day of extra time because of my use of da vinci or chat gpt um we've been using it for a long time at at my pay rate at my advanced age 15 20 minutes a day is real money i appreciate the time back i really do and and I could see it becoming more and more valuable as we incorporate these tools into the daily workflow and process. It's not taking away my job. It's just making me better at my job. And it's not going to steal anybody's gig. It's just going to make everybody better at, at their job. And if everybody was like 15% better, can you imagine the explosion in productivity? Just 15%, 10%, 5%. I don't think yeah. I get 5% better ordinarily in a given year. I, I don't know that. I mean, I, I try to get better at my job every day, but I, I don't know what my percentage improvement is, but this thing, I can see the time coming back. Yeah, I used I feel to spend like X amount of time doing this and now I spend this amount of time. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. It's a massive leap forward in a very short period of time. And we know that, that it will just continue to accelerate exponentially with each improvement, right? It's crazy that we've crossed that threshold uh, here and also just like kind of mass awareness of it, right? Like it's, it's because media what was it the uh media's job is to be seen yeah. right like that's it it's here now everybody knows about it it's it's, it's exactly what that is you know yeah. people don't think exponentially everybody kind of thinks like tomorrow is going to be just like today and because yeah. in most of our human experience you know tomorrow i'm going to get up have breakfast go to the gym walk the dog whatever you're going to do every day like you do it every day and the days don't seem very different but in this case tomorrow's nothing like today the way i i like to think about it is imagine a, a lily pond and it's there's one lily pad in it and you are told that the lily pads themselves will double every day for 30 days and at the end of 30 days the pond will be fully covered so on what day is the pond 50 percent covered day 29 it takes 29 days to get the pond half done so anytime you walk by that pond as a human being you don't think anything's happening one is a little number. Two is a little number. It's two lily pads and there's four. Four is a little number. 
Eight's a little number. 16's a little number. 32 is a little big pond, right? You don't think about it. Day 29, only half the pond in the hall. Look, half the pond isn't even covered yet. The next morning you wake up, it's completely done. We don't think that way. We don't, but that's what's happening here. Definitely. Yeah, definitely is. Right. And, and it, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different ways. Uh, I think that the, the, the acceleration of technology is, uh, is impacting us. I mean, we've covered a, a, a big swath of it right now. One of the ones that we talk about a lot here on the show is, is fandom, uh, whether it's sports or gaming or, 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 you know, other elements, it's a big part of the world of NFTs and, and how it's been applied so far to date, you mm-hmm. know, rewarding folks and, and making them part of those communities in a, in a really distinctive transferable, um, but also transparent way. Um, where, where do you see kind of the, the current uh, state of fandom going here in the, in the near future? Like how is that world impacted in your view? I think we're at a very interesting inflection point. The in in America, the TV business is the football business. The NFL contract is signed to 2031. So between now and 2031, what we understand as broadcast television is unlikely to change very much. They've made a couple deals for streaming. Uh, we know that they will they will continue to do what they're doing with ABC. I'm sorry, with uh, ESPN, ABC. Uh, CBS and Fox, because those deals are an NBC for Sunday Night Football. Th- those deals are in place till 2031. So we got we got some time where the businesses we understand, television and fandom, are unlikely to change very much. While this is going on, Gen Z is coming of age. Gen Alpha is coming of age. They are completely different human beings than their predecessors. These are children that are, I don't even want to say umbilically tied to their devices. It's it's way more than that. Their brains literally work differently because their brains have been trained differently. And they're not going to accept what their parents or their grandparents accept as entertainment. They just aren't. And they are going to need a much deeper level of experience. And it is going to have to come much faster. And we see it. It's it's it, it, it's just obvious to everybody. What's not obvious is how traditional sports are going to evolve to meet the challenge. I'm not saying that every, that NFL is going to be three on three blockies on a, you know, I, on somebody's screen somewhere, but something is going to change over time. And I think most of the sports business, which is so based on money, right? you got a lot of new stadiums being built. And if I have to take a guess I look at SoFi Stadium as the model for the future. Stadium has 1,400 small cells and wireless cells in it where you can literally uh, get about 70,000 people into SoFi. Everybody could be FaceTiming with grandma at the same time and get a good, solid signal with good, solid bandwidth. That's not true in most arenas and most stadiums, but it's true there. That's the model for like, what experience now do I, am I empowered to bring? Are the players clickable? Can I wear, can I wear a, a, um, a near field communications chip? Can the arena know that I'm sitting in my seat? If I'm wearing a Jersey that has an NFC, does, does the, uh, um, does the Mac address on my phone or the, I have five radios on my smartphone. Does the phone know where it is? Does the stadium know where the phone is? Does it have privileges? Is there um, an NFT or uh, some version of a, either a self-sovereign ID or a decentralized ID or non-transferable NFT? Do I have a soul-bound token? Like, what is it that is identifying me to where I am and empowering, again, with data, either the league, the club, the venue, sponsors, to surface some experience that will enhance your day so greatly that it has changed the way you think about going to the arena, the stadium, tailgating, this is what has to happen. And it's it's terrible that it's infrastructure based, but unless you've got insane connectivity and insane, literally insane data processing capability, it can't change. You can't do what I just described inside of most arenas and most football stadiums. You just don't have the wireless connectivity. So as these uh, infrastructure plays start to come uh, into being, and look, the tools are getting better. Apple Apple's going to come out with um, uh, XR uh, OS, their extended reality operating system, and their first, you know, augmented reality headset is supposed to come out sometime this year. And that's the beginning. 
we've got a little ways to go, but I think a lot of how we're going to experience sports is data driven because we want to know all the things we want to know about our players. And we want to know if, you know, I think some of you might have watched a football game in the playoffs that doesn't need to be mentioned that where the officiating might have sucked and there might be a team going to the Super Bowl who maybe shouldn't have gone, but for some penalties because the officiating <clears throat> sucked. A lot of the things that were officiated could have easily, easily been interpreted by, let's just say, um, technical means and keep those particular referees off the damn field. I mean, they were watching and weren't making the right calls. Anyone could see what was going on there. Hmm. What's my fan experience going to be like if I want, if, if I'm enraged that way and I'm a, how will I change that experience? What, what, what needs to cobble together do, to, to just make everything better? And then. Well, even if there's some sort of AI determination of fairness, you still need some type of referee yeah, robot of scapegoat um, that you I'm, can yell at. Um, I'm, during I'm, doing the game. Yeah. I'm doing this tongue firmly. <laughs> I'm doing this tongue firmly in cheek. <laughs> now, hold on, though. The, the coaches, though, they're already using analytics to try to drive what plays they're calling, right? With great so, feedback loops, too. Well, yeah. And, and yeah. I don't know, if Shelly, if you're familiar with our friends at Fan Controlled Sports, um, but they're, we talked to them on a Twitter space uh, maybe a month or two ago, and they're literally building a basketball court uh, with, like, led enabled floors so that uh you know it's it's a beyond the game of basketball where they have to go to a certain part of the court that lights up so they can make extra points and things like this right i mean um we're they're already developing these really awesome I, kind of things look i think i think at the end of the day all of this is trial and error and tastes evolve we have a new generation of fans that are coming of age they have very different expectations than their older siblings, than their parents or their grandparents. And we're going to see who wins. Right now, sports are expensive to participate in. It's a big money. It's a big money game uh, across the every professional sports league. When I think about the future of fandom, I know that it is two things will have to be true. One, we're going to need to collect an awful lot of data. And the other is we're going to need a lot of infrastructure in order to deliver experiences that these youngsters are going to expect. And uh, the reason I say youngsters, a uh, very old word, is that the group that already likes sports the way it is, truthfully, is on its way out, not on its way in. Like it's a new group coming. This is a nice big group of people that they're going to have different expectations. The good news is everyone I know at every one of the leagues we work with, there are innovation teams doing all kinds of great stuff. And I'm not at liberty yeah. to talk about it, but it's the stuff that we're seeing every day is like, yeah, I don't know if it's going to work or not. That's for that's for the new audiences to decide, but it's not for lack of trying. No one's sitting on their hands thinking, oh, it's fine. We'll just do it as usual. It's just not what's happening. Everyone's trying new stuff every day. It's really the most exciting time I have ever. I've been in business. Our, our company's 40 years old, um, 40, going to be 41 in May, the, the company. And honestly, this is the most exciting year we've ever had. And I said that last year. <laughs> yeah. You know, one, one particular sport I just think is bright for disruption and it's just pure intuition is, is tennis. You see that recently they unleashed the ability for players to get coached from the sidelines and and they know that the game has to be exciting for for people to to watch it i think i think that's interesting i also want to um sort of delve into the dna that gives uh like folks like lebron james the the longevity they have to continue to be a top scorer and and break records that haven't been you know broken in in decades um I think there's something in that athletic performance arena that will continue to be uh, a focal point as well. But uh, one topic that I want to make sure we covered and we were sort of chatting this weekend about what, what you're doing and, and what's top of mind for you and your clients. And this came up, which is um, SSI. So self-sovereign identifiers and, and FIDO, fast identity online, uh, a little bit of an a sequitur, but I think it's a it's a really important thing to to cover. It's not something we've talked about on the show before. What role do these guys have in terms of the NFT industry? So first of all, as everybody listening knows, uh, NFTs are smart contracts. And for those of you who don't know, a smart contract is just like a regular contract, except when the terms and conditions are met, the contract executes automatically. 
generally in cryptocurrency, but that's not necessarily the, uh, mandated. It just happens to be how they're associated right now. One of the big questions we're having, and Google's in the middle of a giant lawsuit, both in Europe and here, uh, Facebook is being sued, everybody's being sued in the data business over this idea of data privacy. And the idea behind self-sovereign identifiers or decentralized identifiers is that we, in a Web3 environment, meaning a platform of decentralized tools that allow both users and creators to share in the value they create, that's my definition, in that defined world, a self-sovereign ID or a decentralized ID would empower the user to choose what data is shared with wherever they were, the venue. So imagine the following. I'm walking up to a bar and I'm in New York State. Now in New York State, the only requirement to walk into a bar is that you be over the age of 21 years old. They don't care if you're male or female. They don't care what race you are. They don't care anything. They don't care about anything. You just need to be over 21 to walk into a bar in New York State. So today, the way it works is you walk up, there's a bouncer or somebody guarding the door, and they say, may I see your identification, please? And you take out whatever you have, generally a, a driver's license, which has your address, which they don't need, your name, which they don't need, your driver's license number, which they don't need, a picture, which they actually do need because they have no other way to verify that you and your license are, are like belong to one another, and your birth date, which they actually need. They don't really need to know your birth date. They just need to know that you're over 21. So they're getting too much information, but they need that in order to do the calculation. If you meet the one standard test, which is I think it's you because the picture's close and the birth date's right, so two standard tests, you get to pass. Otherwise, you don't. Imagine you're biometrically identified by your phone and attached to your phone just for this argument. And there is either a DID or an SSI in your phone, which is sitting on a blockchain, which basically is a smart contract or an NFT uh, that's sitting on a blockchain that has a bunch of metadata that describes you, but you choose, you choose what anyone gets when they hit this thing. You walk up to the bar, there's no bouncer. The door is locked with a big red glow around it. But as you walk up, it checks to see if your wallet contains the appropriate identification and the, or meets the test. In this case, the only test is, are you over 21? If the answer is yes, the door turns green, but it gets better than that because once you walk into the bar and you, you're there, you are now known to this, are you entitled to the VIP room? Are you entitled to a free drink? Are we going to seat you in a special area? Yes, because, yes, yes. Because your wallet and your behaviors, previous behaviors, stored publicly, but not associated with you, but with it, your, your ID, have been verified by a tr untrusted, unknown, fully trustless, because it needs to be, third party. That is really the definition of what a Web3 environment ought to be like. Now, I can also surface augmented reality experiences or virtual reality experiences or extended reality experiences in this bar for you in this venue, because I, I have a sense of what this wallet wants, what it does, what it is. So this SSI uh, or, or, or DID sitting in this wallet has a tremendous amount of power, both to keep you as anonymous as you want to be kept, but also to give you the rights and privileges you deserve. So it's a really different way to think about how to do this if there were an open marketplace for this NFT, if it were transferable. So maybe I have more than one. Maybe I've got a soul bound token the way that Vitalik in, uh, um, laid it out. And that is the senior non-transferable NFT to my little NFTs that are sitting below, my little identifiers that I'm using. I have one for my college music experience. I have one for you. There are many different schemas we've seen. The stuff we're working on right now are that level of practical use case, which gather data as anonymously as the user wants, create value for both the 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 holder of the D, uh, uh, of the DID or SSI, and um, so it's both the users and the creators. Like the venue owner gets to share in the value, the sponsor gets to share in the value, the holder of the ID gets to share in the value created by the fact that that particular holder is in the venue. So it's a really nice flip of the script. It gives, it empowers people yeah. to act in ways they would not able be able to act ordinarily. You can't do it with a straight ID card. And it's like, like a loyalty program on steroids. 
it's it may not be the best use case ever, but it's the one that we see the most traction in in the work that we're doing. And it seems to be like as look, all the crypto millionaires became crypto thousandaires. So so all the get rich quick people sort of headed for the hills. The people who are left are super serious about what are the business outcomes that we can achieve using these tools. And, and is there a business case where we need to invest in the answer? In most cases is yes, there is. And it, it spans a very wide gamut from on one side, fraud prevention and supply chain monitoring all the way over to user experience. Like what can I do to make people happier or, or, or enrich their experience in some way? And that, that, yeah. that's the work we're doing, Josh. So that's where it is. And that, yeah, and that makes total sense when you say is there a business use case because you know, all these things make so much sense, but what's standing in the way is one, people are used to the traditional ways of doing it. So they'll get confused if you say, oh, it's just a phone. There's a, but once the use, the businesses go ahead and implement the use cases, right? And it's just there, then it becomes no brainers for people to, oh, I just have to walk up to the door. It's on my phone. No problem. I'm just going to do it, right? I but think, somebody's got to implement that. Yeah. I think when you, when Apple Pay and Samsung Pay and Google Pay and like when the, when the <laughs> big wallets start to accept SSI or DID, when the big wallets allow you to put some kind of, of representation of your of your tokens in them and, and they're readable, I think that's when you're going to see this thing explode. And until that happens, it's really hard because you've got to download an app and you like you have all the problems you have with a good old fashioned app deployment. You really need this to be part of a wallet that is that's used every day. And people don't even use their Apple wallets every day. You know, you see some people who are like really into Apple Pay and some people really into Google Pay or Samsung Pay. But for the most part, people still reach for their credit cards. People aren't really doing the whole phone thing with the NFC tapping the way they, not not at any level that would make you go, oh, sea change. Mm -hmm. But if this were to be implemented, I think a sea change could happen because there'd be value created for the user. Right now it's convenience. Is it more convenient to tap your phone or hand them your credit card? I, I don't know. That's a toss up. But if if it's tap your phone and get all this interesting stuff to happen, maybe. Yeah. Well, just like the pond analogy, it's going to happen like overnight. Um, I, I want to take it back to chat GPT because there's this topic we haven't talked about yet, um, which is kind of like prompt crafting. Yeah. Um, we might have like kind of mentioned it breezing by. But uh, what, what can you say more about, you know, this concept of prompt crafting and how it's going to be built into kind of working with your your AI coworker these days and then beyond. So for, we coined the term prompt crafting at the Palmer Group. I, I've also heard prompt engineering or prompt tuning. There's a lot of different ways people describe it. That's just our way. What we have been working on and what we work on with our clients and where we have spent an inordinate amount of time, I mean a crazy amount of time, is trying to get the most out of uh, GPT-3, 3.5. And uh, most people will interface with GPT-3 or 3.5 using chat GPT. Most people aren't going to go to the various models over at OpenAI and start to open up APIs and deal with it. So in order to get the most out of chat GPT, uh, as of uh, the recording of this podcast, you could get on a wait list and spend 20 bucks a month to get um, privileged access to GPT, chat GPT plus. I'm not shilling for them, but it kind of guarantees that you can get on when you want to get on and that you can use this thing at will, which anyone who's tried to use chat GP up to now knows that the free version either is either online or it isn't. You can get to it or you can't. It, it It's not as reliable as, as you hope it would be. The paid version is as reliable as you'd hope it would be. To craft a prompt, is to properly describe what you want to the model. Now, because it's a, a pre-trained transformer and it's a large language model, it understands English. But that doesn't mean you want to speak slang to it. That doesn't mean you want to use contractions everywhere and and metaphor and uh, you're not it's not a person. It's read the internet up to 2021 at the moment. And it knows what it knows. So the first thing you want to do always is tell chat GPT what it is. Give it a role. What are you doing? So you are a tech blogger. You are a data scientist. You are a secretary. You are an administrative assistant. You're something. So it knows. You must tell it what the audience is. It needs to know what it's supposed to do. For the best outcomes, if you're looking for something really long form, like a, a, a long blog post, 
you're going to ask it to make an outline first. And if you can find a paragraph yourself of what it is you're looking for that really goes deep, and you might spend a few minutes thinking about what do I really want out of this? You might not want to ask for the whole essay at once. Sometimes it's better to ask for an outline and then say, uh, at, at, in the next prompt, based on the outline you've just provided, can you expand point one with 200 words, including examples about so that you are so explicit? And then you'll look at just that paragraph and decide, is that is that what I need or do I need more? The beautiful thing about this uh, is that is that it can bring you examples if the examples are you know, you said it's not good at history. I, I disagree. If you ask it specifically what you ab about a thing in history, it will get it. If you ask it for a point of view, it may give you someone else's point of view. So you're asked the wrong question at Chat GPT, it's going to start giving you nonsense from the internet. But if you said, uh, you know, uh, during the Roman Empire at the end and the coins, blah, blah, and the way Caesar did this, this, and like if you give it what you want, and in the context of, a rampant inflation and you know runaway inflation and uh, territorial strife. Like if you give it real parameters, this thing's going to come back to you with something that looks like a college essay. And so prompt crafting is this is this constant coaching. And I think the worst thing you can do with any of these tools, whether it's Mid Journey for Art or Stable Diffusion or ChatGPT, the worst thing you can do is write a sentence and expect it to give you an outcome and then go, oh, this doesn't work. Because that's you not understanding. This is a tool. It's just a tool. And, you know, it's a, technology is a fancy word for a tool. We've been using tools since someone figured out how to use a rock, you know, to hunt with. Uh, I, I, someone figured out, hey, you know, if I put a point on this stick, it's going to be better than a blunt stick. Someone figured out if it was a long stick with a point, it's going to be better than a short stick with a point. Like, those are tools. This is a yeah. tool. You need to constantly, to constantly hone it and yourself. One good thing is, if you have an account at Mid Journey, at Stable Diffusion, at or your own model or 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 the main ones, or ChatGPT, it actually starts to learn from you. You can tell it what tone of voice you want to be in. You can tell it the kind of character in a snarky but not insulting way. Please say, but know what the word snarky means because it does. So if you don't, and you say in a snarky but not insulting way, well, snarky and insulting, you can be snarky and not be insulting. If you think those words mean the same thing, you're not asking, if you say, you're not asking it enough. So you have to press it. I really think that subject matter expertise and practicing your prompts, um, we've, we've do, we're, we're gonna put up a, a free, at Med Academy, we're, we're going to put up a free course in prompt crafting. But there's so many wonderful YouTube videos, so many bad ones too. But you'll know the good ones because you see the outcome happen immediately. So just type in like prompt engineering or prompt tuning or prompt, just the word prompt in chat GPT. Yes. Tons of blogs out there. It. It's it's just, you know, you're going to have to practice it. All right. I'm just, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> I asked chat GPT in a snarky but non insulting way, please say we've got to move to the next question. Um, it's, but it's still in the thread uh, where I asked it to write a poem. So it said, all right, folks, let's step lively, move along. Time flies by quickly. Another question to prolong, not one to dilly-dally. We've got places to be. So let's leave this behind. And on the next, shall we? Next question. <laughs> that is, I just think that's awesome. I'm sorry. That is awesome. It's written all over it. That's hilarious. What do we got up next? Are we under the next segment, guys? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. I think I think so. I think that's a good place to uh, to end this segment. I mean, again, we could go on forever about this stuff because it's just like amazing. You have questions about blockchain, like how big of a block can you chain without throwing out your back, or have you received that chain letter? How did you block it? And does blockchain taste better, barbecued or deep fried? <laughs> Luckily, you don't have to ponder these quandaries alone anymore because Blockchain Training Alliance is here to answer them and also train you in real world blockchain issues that will impact your business's bottom line and oriented future forward along the ley lines of the most important tech humanity has perfected since harnessing atomic energy. If you're into those sorts of things, 
Blockchain Training Alliance is a top leader in the field, counting among its clients IBM, Microsoft, Disney, Morgan Stanley, and many more, and offering a wide array of technical and non-technical courses. Whether you're a computer neophyte training for an incredible career in this new space, or a coding expert honing your skills, Blockchain Training Alliance will help you steer your ship home safely, filled with treasure. <laughs> Arg. So hurry and sign up for the Blockchain Training Alliance course that best fits your needs at blockchaintrainingalliance.com. Use discount code EDGEOF for 50% off and start your next block today. But let's let's shift gears, man. Let's um let's do something fun here. And it's a segment that we call uh, Edge Quick Hitters. I would be curious as to what Chat GPT would say to our Edge Quick Hitters. We might have to uh <laughs> might we have actually, to do actually do an episode where we ask. <laughs> but in this case, uh, we'd love your answers, Shelly. These are basically just a fun and quick way for us to get to know you a little bit better. We're looking for kind of short single word or few word responses, but we may go a little bit deeper here or there uh, if we find something of interest. So um, let's dive in. What do you say? Yeah, go for it. Okay, cool. All right. Question number one is, what is the first thing you remember ever purchasing in your life? That's really easy. What do we got? First thing I ever bought in my life was a soprano saxophone. Oh, wow. Did you still have that original purchase? Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. Man. That's cool. Uh, question number two, what's the first thing you remember ever selling in your life? Uh, well, I worked at my dad's music store. So the first thing I ever sold was a, um, a Fender uh, Stratocaster. Oh, right on. Yeah, fellow uh, musician and, uh, and Ethan. Uh, jazz I, also, pianist. I worked at Sam Ash for a while. The enemy. Out of college. <laughs> <laughs> the enemy. Nice. Did, now, did you buy the saxophone from your dad's music store? I or? didn't. I actually, I, I bought it from a wholesaler. That from the enemy. Was, uh, no, I didn't. I bought it. It was a Yannick Asawa um, Soprano sax. And it, it, I bought it with my own money. I mean, it was like my biggest purchase, my first really big purchase. Probably Lovely. bought some candy bars before that. But like, yeah. that's what I remember. I remember playing about 50 Sopranos and grabbing cool. that one. Cool. Yeah. Question three. What's the most recent thing you purchased? A lock picking kit from the lock picking lawyer's website. Let's go. All right. <laughs> Genesis, there's, there's, the Genesis set and a whole bunch of locks to go with it. I got this guy on TikTok blew my mind. Then I found him on YouTube. I'm like, I'm learning to do this. And it's really fun. It's pretty cool. Yeah. That, that's, 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 that's there's like definitely. competitions and stuff, right? Like, it's yeah, like, yeah. yeah. No, this, yeah. It's like a whole world of like complete. And believe me, you cannot be thinking about anything else when you're doing this. It's oh. like the most Zen thing in the world. <laughs> it's like you're doing it by feel. And it's like, wow, what's this? I mean, it's like, it's really it. It's fun. That's the uh, most recent purchase. Dropped a couple. I feel like that's uh that's the beginning of a, a novella or something. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's something there. Yeah. Uh, very cool. Yeah. Question number four. Uh, what's the most recent thing you sold? My house in Vermont. All right. <laughs> All right. It's it's getting colder over there. It's a little chilly right now. Yeah, it is. Um. Yeah. We we after 26 years. Um. One of our children. Uh lives up there full time now and we're not we're not responsible for uh getting kids to program uh, uh -huh. in the morning and you know we're just we're now we're just ski bums so All right. we're, we're we're now moochers so yeah we yeah that's the most recent thing i sold very cool. All right. Hey, time to sell over. it's oh, time to sell ahead. Vermont folks. That's our yeah that's our yeah yeah. yeah question five what's your most prized possession? The thing that I prize above all things else. Yes sir everything else how much my family cares about me and how much I care about them. Hmm. Family enters the equation uh, often on this, uh, on this question, but never put that way. I really like how you put that. Question number six, if you could buy anything in the world, digital, physical service and experience that's currently for sale, what would it be? What do you got your eye on? That's one of the greatest questions I, I've never, I, I, I have to say with brutal honesty, I've never asked myself that question in any manner, shape or form. I, I just, I wouldn't even know where to begin to answer that question. Things that I want that I can't afford, I have strived for. Things that mm -hmm. I want that I can afford over the course of my life, things that were really important to me have become unimportant and things that were unimportant to me have become really important. Mm -hmm. But none of them are material. Like there's just no material thing that would ever get my attention. Yeah. That way, if I need it for business, it's not a purchase. It's an investment. Mm. So you said buy. And the way I'm thinking about it is like, what would I buy for myself other than time, healthy mm. time on earth? I can't imagine what I would buy. Like, I, I just, I just don't think that way, but thanks for asking. Yeah. I, I don't have an answer. 
Whenever, whenever we ask that one, um, I think of this problem solving strategy. I don't know if you guys are film, familiar with it. It's called What Would Croesus Do? Um, Croesus was an extremely wealthy king that basically had unlimited funds. Um, and it's, I, I like the problem solving strategy. And it's basically like when you run into a problem where you have limited funds, just think to yourself, what if you had unlimited funds? What would you do, right? And, and often, you you know, you just come up with something creative that doesn't even necessarily require unlimited funds, but you open up your thinking. I do have, that, I, you know? but you know what? I Now that you've said that, I actually have an answer. Nice. <laughs> but but I never thought about it till just, it's like, oh, if I really had unlimited, for like, absolutely, like, didn't, like, complete Elon Musk money. Yeah. I would probably buy myself, after much exploration, I would probably buy myself a nine-foot concert grant from Bosendorfer. Love it. I have, I'm a a piano Yamaha player. Six, I have a Yamaha 6-1 in the house here. And and I it, it's a piano I love. But if I I was gonna if I just didn't care, it's like, oh, you know what? Let me get one of those. <laughs> I'd probably get one of those. There you that'd go. Be, that'd be fun to have. All right. Well, we'll shift gears a little bit on this next one. Okay. <laughs> if you could you know pass I was going, on, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. If you could pass on one of your personality traits to the next generation, what would it be? Curiosity. Mm. Let's flip the script then. Un insatiable curiosity. I think we've seen that throughout the conversation today and we do appreciate it. I, I just, I think that, you know, I, the most interesting people I've ever met and I'm not one of them, but the people I've ever met that I thought was the more, most interesting are the people who, who ask why about everything. Yeah. What is this? Yeah. Why is it? How does this work? I, I, they're just fun to talk to. So you just, could, you just described my four-year-old son perfectly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> lots of whys. Uh, flip, let's flip it on its head though. Question eight, if you could eliminate one of your personality traits from the next generation, what would that be? Grudge holding. Mm. That's uh, easy. Yeah. That's a good one. Costly, I like that one too. Costly for sure. Make that go away. I, yeah. I'd love to be able to forgive and forget. That would be awesome if I could just forget the people that have crossed the line. Yeah. And, and not in that creepy sort of severance show way, but more in like the healthy, it's there, but it, it means nothing to you. It's just the past. You know, I mean, grudge holding in the classic definition of the word, it's not, I'm not proud of it, but it's just if I get rid of it, like really rid of it, like gone. Yeah, it'd be awesome. <laughs> and yeah. if I could not pass that on to anybody, I, I, that's, that's not, it's not healthy. I don't, I don't think it's healthy. It's not a good thing to do. I'm guilty yeah. of it constantly, but it's not, it's not. It's, a, it's a hard one for sure. Uh, a little easier question. Nine. What'd you do just before joining us on the show? I was talking to a gentleman who I had never met before, who had a kind of a parallel life. We were introduced by uh, the Dean of the Newhouse school. He's got a friend uh, in the Ukraine who has come up with a really interesting generative AI tool set. And he wanted to know if I would have helped him evaluate it to see if it was worthy of investment or further study. Hmm. We spent a half hour on Zoom, just literally hung up the end of that thing one minute before I joined you guys. Well, that's a pretty solid, uh, a solid uh, ending, I think, here uh, to uh, these questions. So the last piece of it is really just a simple one. And that's what are you doing next? <laughs> what I am going to do next is I am going to pack up here. Uh, I'm going to take my entire family to Deer Valley, uh, and we are going to spend a little bit of time celebrating a very big birthday of mine. And then I want to come back and hit the ground running because there's way more to do than has ever been done. So we have like we just have more stuff to do. That's Deer Valley, you, Deer Valley, Utah. Yeah, that's the yeah. one. Yeah. I was just over there um, for an event and had to uh, take a very small plane back to LA with, with Baron Davis. Um, and it's just beautiful over in Deer Valley, the, 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 the mountain landscape and, and you can smell the salt in the air and, uh, yeah, I'm sure you'll have an amazing time. Yeah. We, we, we've been many times and it's just a wonderful place to go skiing and we're Vermont skiers. So they have so much snow in Deer Valley right now. We're just looking forward to, a a great uh, a great ski vacation and nice. uh, you, you know from our ski vacation <laughs> yeah <laughs> but no, we're just looking forward to skiing out west and yeah that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go and i'm gonna turn a certain age there we go all right big one awesome man well i think that wraps uh edge quick hitters of course we always appreciate the uh, great insights great t tidbits about you personally shelly so thanks for sharing with us man um i, had, I threw this little piece in here 
just a couple of little facts about some of the things that, that we talked about today that I thought were were kind of interesting. You wanted to hit. We, we mentioned Star Destroyers in that initial scene in Star Wars. And I had heard this and I, I just pulled this out there, but like they range in length, like crazy lengths, like basically from the smallest one, I think is one mile long to the largest one uh, is 12 miles long in Star Wars lore or whatever. It's pretty in the canon, uh, interesting yeah. thing that you don't really recognize. And there's no real sense of scale in the middle of space uh, in these Star Wars movies, but that was a, that was an interesting tidbit. And then uh, and he mentioned- well, you get a sense of it when the Star Destroyer crashes into the death star yeah yeah you, you get a sense of like how big it's supposed to be based on the curvature of the death star you sort of say to yourself how big is that thing exactly yeah right uh, you know that was yeah. a because it's supposed to be moon size the death star right so it's right. like uh yeah but i yeah. gotcha yeah that's a I big just, one not that i'm too much of a star wars nerd and they were talking about like yeah <laughs> we can see that uh we, we were talking about just like you know kind of AI and how it's tapping into kind of creativity or the, 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 the science behind it, the methodology behind it in chord progressions. I know the, uh, the old axis of awesome chord progression. And, and is this right? I don't know. Is it the, is it the one, five, six, five move? That's like all pop songs are basically based on. So is that, uh, the, well, um, Sheeran, Ed Sheeran says three, six, two, five is the progression that he can do for every sing, every song over it, mm -hmm. And he's theoretically, you probably could fake, 90% of pop songs into 3625. The most popular chord progression probably from the 50s and 60s is is 145 and there's a there's in jazz the most popular progression without question is 251, but 3625 is what he he was that, that's what you're calling up. It's the I've seen him do it. He'll get up and yeah. say, oh, this chord progression. It's the most famous chord like I can sing any song and people call it any song and he just does it and it's funny. Yeah. Yeah, he kind of yeah. tweaks the melody a little bit to make it happen, but yes, sure. yes, the short answer is yes. <laughs> so good one for any uh, any anybody that wants to fiddle around with it out there. So anyway, two two quick kind of facts. By the way, those numbers are the are the are what scale tone the chord corresponds to in a diatonic scale. In case you're wondering, so if you're at the piano, you're trying to figure out what one is, you know, pick any note. That's one, and then count up four notes. That's the four chord. Count up five notes. That's the five chord. That's you know, that's just, it. You know, it's not it's not it's not rocket science. It's music. Right. It's fun, though. Um, well, cool. Well, anyway, that was uh, just one I threw in there because I thought there were a couple of fun uh, topics. I wish we but... could close out with a jam session, uh, but that's not oh, any time today. Uh, next, <laughs> next gonna be, time. You're going to be with us at Outer Edge, LA, Shelly? Uh, I'm planning to be out OK, there. well, we got to play some music, man. Let's let's oh, man. let's put together. We can get uh, Dave from Orange Comet and we could jam out. Um, yeah, I'm I think in. it'll be awesome. Scott and, Page and on those, saxophone. Yeah. And for those that, that weren't at the inaugural NFTLA, Shelly um, had quite the assignment. Um, oh, my God. G, yeah. G, so, so Jiho uh, from Axie Infinity uh, was our first keynote speaker, and Shelly was uh, moderating that conversation. And, of course, there was a $650 million hack. That morning. Uh, the, that, that, that morning. Earlier yeah. that morning. And... Jiho still, hey, he showed up and 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 you asked the question and and it created a moment. It created a moment in time that uh, will never be forgotten. Yeah, that was that was a crazy morning. I I was so impressed that Jeff was willing to come on stage at that morning. I first of all, I didn't expect him to show up at all, and the fact that he got there and the look in his eyes, yeah, it's indescribable. I mean, that's. Yeah, it was 173,600 ETH and 25 and a half million USDT. Gone. Oh, oh. What a gut punch. That's, yeah. I mean, we could talk long and hard about things they did wrong. I mean, all that was in one wallet. Five of nine validator nodes on the Ronin side chain. Five of nine. That's it. For 625, 650 million. I mean, we could go deep into technologically why that was really not smart. But the thing that was amazing was that he had the guts and the and I think the the class to come and just stand before everybody. I mean, Josh couldn't believe it. none of us could believe it. Was yeah. The show was like, oh, are you kidding me? It's like this yeah. guy shows up and wait. So yeah, that was quite a thing. I don't know that we're going to replicate that at uh, Outer Edge, <laughs> but hopefully nobody gets hacked like that. Yeah, I hope not. <laughs> Hey there, NFT space cadet. Let's zoom in on the globe from outer space today to Abbott Kinney Boulevard in Venice Beach, LA. Let me show you a cosmic tech beacon that shines out among the bustle of fashion, art, and food there. 
It's a thriving software dev, data science, and design studio known as AE Studio, where scores of the sharpest minds have come together to help founders and execs create software and machine learning solutions that are not only profitable and increase our agency as humans, but that give us that warm, fuzzy feeling that elegant tech so wonderfully does. AE's breadth of talent allows them to build anything from instillvideo.com it's a health, fitness, and wellness app that makes your chakras tingle to award-winning brain-computer interface solutions that could quite literally bend our minds. Oh, and keep an eye out for Token Runners, their NFT white label marketplace, as well as our highly anticipated NFT drop, Boomer NFT. Now, for all you DGENs who strive to shed the cummerbund and pearls comes a jaw-dropping, awe-inspiring partnership not seen since the heyday of Shaq and Kobe, it's called Edge of AE Studio, and you can find out all about it at edgeofae.com. That's right, this full service, soup to nuts, end to end, whole enchilada NFT service can help you, yes, you, Randy, launch your NFT project. Edge of NFT and AE Studio have come together like Voltron to get your project in gear so you can hightail it straight to the moon, stardom, and maybe even your own private yacht. Go to edgeofae.com to find out more. That's edgeofae.com. Actual results may vary depending on moon landing location, domain of stardom, scale and model of yacht, as well as weather scale model of yacht or actual yacht. Should we move on to hot topics? Yeah, let's, let's do one. it. Let's, hit, let's just do yeah, one we've been, hot We've been topic. going for a little bit, so let's hit yep. the big one. Yes. Okay. Hot topic for today. Amazon may launch NFT initiative soon. Amazon is rumored to be unveiling an NFT initiative Part of the retail giant's larger push into Web3, according to a report from BlockWorks, the hash panel discusses what it means uh, to Web3 developments and if the reported spring timeline will come to fruition. Well, I mean, this actually reminds me of, of 2021, um, where we heard various announcements of, of players uh, you know, getting into blockchain and, and NFTs that we didn't quite expect. And But I'm actually surprised right now to hear some of these announcements because you know uh, for all intents and purposes uh and to many folks things look kind of slow and you know like things aren't moving but uh yeah, yeah what are your thoughts on, on this yeah one, Josh? i mean I'll, I'll i'll jump in first and just say look amazon's a very big company and big companies move a little slower so um there's a lot that's been cooking behind the scenes um in the corporate world i'm sure shelly can shed some light on it and it just takes a little longer to to make the sausage when you're a bigger company so uh i'm i'm excited you know this is part of of the 10 year uh sort of plan when it comes to web3 and nfts and you know i spoke to someone yesterday that was very confident that that we have not even experienced the beginning of what's possible with NFTs. And I think there's signals like this that, that definitely perk you up. Um, and, you know, for one, this is one of the reasons where we sort of evolved the theme of, of the event to Outer Edge LA, because you get all these converging things like, like what Amazon is doing in the cloud and, and, and whatnot converging with NFTs. And, and then, you know, we don't know yet what magic will happen as a result. Shelly, what are your thoughts? Amazon is like Alien from the movie of the same name. It can live in any environment. It has acid for blood and it kills everything it sees. It is the most vicious beast ever created in the history of business. The reason it's the most vicious beast is that it learns. Amazon Marketplace was an abject failure when it started and they regrouped and they learned from it and they now have Amazon Marketplace that is the Amazon Marketplace we understand. I am so excited about Amazon doing NFTs because no matter what the outcome is, if this thing fails miserably or if it's a smash success, one thing is guaranteed. Amazon's going to figure it out because they've committed to it. Unlike our friends at Starbucks, who I don't know what that was a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, there's there's been a couple of really unfortunate uh, Lamborghini. I think it was Lamborghini a couple of weeks ago. Also, not really the greatest out of the box performance, but when Amazon screws up, they they lick their wounds, they learn what they did wrong, and they come right back and they get it right. And if we're trying to understand NFTs at retail, there is no better company on this earth to help us understand that as an industry than these guys. So I am 
super stoked. I could be completely wrong about this. They could be completely going to screw the pooch, put up nonsense and then walk away from it. But it's not, that would not be historically what Amazon does. Historically, what Amazon does is they try, they learn. If it fails, they fix. And sometimes they go away for a minute and fix it for a long time. And then they come out with something that's completely different, but based on what they learned. The history of Amazon is is built on these kinds of, of experiments and ex experiences that they've brought to market. I couldn't be more excited about it. I saw it. I was like jumping around. It's like, yeah, we're going to learn something now. This is going to be great. So I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, no awesome. doubt. Yeah, pump to see where it goes. And also, I think there's like a whole bunch of back end applications, all the boring stuff, but the stuff that really does move the needle around supply chain and, and all that fun stuff that happens behind the scenes um, that I'm sure they're, they're, they're plugging into. I don't know. I don't think that. Well, one that of their exists, biggest problems, but... no, but one of their biggest problems is that they have uh, counterfeit merchandise available on Amazon. Yeah. One of the best use cases is fraud prevention. And, you know, NFTs can represent anything, including, of course, physical goods. So there's a real opportunity for Amazon to do some amazing stuff in what you're, in what we would all call the back end. you know, eh, not so cool. Yeah. Digital twinning of, of high-end merchandise mm -hmm. right on the top of the list. Yeah. Total. So there's like, there's, I'm, I'm, let's see. We don't need to speculate. It's going to come yeah. out soon enough. But yeah. at the end of the day, um, I think what a lot of people confuse, you know, when the dot com bubble burst, the internet didn't go away. We didn't stop doing websites. Wall Street decided they weren't going to make investments for a year because they got burned because the, because of the bubble. But the progress in the internet did not stop. We're all on the same internet. We're all on the same web from 2000. Yeah. Yeah, you spend a little bit too much time in the sauna, you cool down, and then you get back, you get back in there. And I think when you combine this announcement with the Avalanche Spotify, I'm sorry, Shopify announcement recently, you start to, you know, piece together a really interesting um, puzzle around the future of, of commerce and how it's intersecting with Web3 is that has been discussed for a while, but but last year or two was experiments. Now the big guys are getting into the game. Couldn't have said it better. That's it. Great stuff. All right, y'all. Well, we, we're going to close this uh, amazing conversation out, I think, now. But before we do, Shelly, we got to make sure that we direct folks to the appropriate place to follow you and all the amazing things that you're doing. Where should we send them? <laughs> ShellyPalmer.com. Uh, it's the easiest place, S-H-E-L-L-Y-P-A-L-M-E-R.com. Just go there, sign up for the newsletter. Uh, you can get to Med Academy there. It's at courses.shellypalmer.com. And, uh, you know, we, we, we'd love to have you get our newsletter. I do a bunch of, of uh, streaming events and other things that you can partake of. There's plenty of free stuff there. So, but just go to the website. It's all good. Or follow me on Twitter, you know, at Shelly Palmer. You can do that or Instagram. I'm, I'm easy to find. There it is. All right, y'all check it out. Okay, by well, the way, we've reached. Oh, yeah, go ahead. By the way, just a couple yes. more things. Sorry. Number one, I put on this new jumper because I, I noticed it was kind of inspiration of your Meta Academy branding and also our NFTLA branding. I just got it. Be wearing it in NFTLA. But love it. <laughs> but um, but yeah, this, this last thing. I asked Chat GPT to write a poem for your birthday. Uh, uh -huh. I thought it's bio, uh, your bio. So here we go. A voice in technology, a leader, one so wise, Shelly Palmer, a man who truly realizes. <laughs> I can't believe this. <laughs> uh, the power of words and ideas his pen his might wishing you a birthday filled with joy today and every night wow <laughs> i love it god hey. bless that that's first of all thank you for even thinking to do that and <laughs> gpt chat gpt and gpt3 the underlying technology for making my birthday so special there you go beautiful stuff all right guys look i think we've reached the outer limit at the edge of nfts for today Thanks for exploring with us. We've got space for more adventures on this starship. So invite your friends and recruit some cool strangers that will make this journey all so much better. How? Go to Spotify or iTunes right now, rate us and say something awesome, and then go to edgeofnft.com to dive further down the rabbit hole. Look us up on all major social platforms by typing edge of NFT with no spaces and start a fun conversation with us online. Lastly, be sure to tune in next time for more great NFT content. Thanks again, Shelly, for sharing this time with us today. The views and opinions expressed on the Edge of NFT podcast reflect solely those views and opinions of the show creators and its guests. We are learning as we go just like you. Please make sure to do your own research. Our podcast is not financial advice. There are multiple strategies and not all strategies fit all people. You understand that you are using any and all information available on or through this podcast at your own risk.